to the Explorers. Time traveling through women's history, one era at a time. I'm your host, Kate Armstrong. Before we start, please note that this episode deals with some heavy subject matter and probably isn't suitable for small people, in public parks, or for in the car with your grandma, unless she's the wild kind like mine. And I'm excited to announce that I now have a Patreon page. Becoming a patron helps support the show, and you'll get exclusive access to bonus episodes. The first one will be up by the time you're done listening to this one. Harlots, Cyprians, Soiled Doves, Public Women. The more time we spend in the Victorian era, the more we'll find them everywhere. Some have more freedom, independence, and power than most women in 19th century America. All of them have to use their wits and their wiles to keep afloat amidst a sea of prejudice and STDs. But the word prostitute goes far beyond a job description. It's a label used to control women, any women, who stray too far outside the private sphere. It's a line in the sand, a reminder of what happens when a woman crosses it. But when the Civil War came, so did new opportunities and freedoms along with a swell of very visible prostitution, forcing a very corseted age to confront the sexy part of their lives. And were those lives sexy? Like at all? I know you're imagining pursed lips and very high necklines, but there was definitely some steam going on in this era. Victorians were having sex, and even enjoying it, both within the sacred confines of marriage and not. Horrors! Let's step behind the velvet curtain and talk about sex in Victorian America. We'll explore how women and men relate to sex in their bodies, the idealized expectations, and the reality behind them. Everything from rapidly changing courtship rituals to spicy correspondence and how to spot mail-order contraception. We'll see how war changed the sexual landscape, freeing women, but imperiling and endangering them too. Grab your fishnets, your French renovating pills, and your tiniest corset. Let's go traveling. So here we are in 1861, nestled comfortably into a friend's tastefully decorated parlor. The wine is flowing. The gentlemen are off smoking cigars. Let's get a little wild, shall we? The standards of behavior are strict for true women in this age. Women and men both have their ordained place in the scheme of things. Men go out and do the business. But you, my flower, are a domestic goddess and a moral pillar for all around you. In a culture deeply rooted in Puritanism and the idea that fallen women ruin communities, you are the one who guides our spiritual lives. That's why protecting your purity matters, and why you really mustn't openly express any desire for life's carnal pleasures. But how do you do that, you wonder, hands wringing? Don't worry. We have plenty of reading material to help us figure out how we should behave. The following advice about walking from one place to another comes from a book called Searchlights on Health, Light on Dark Corners a complete sexual science, and a guide to purity and physical manhood. Advice to maiden, wife, and mother, love, courtship, and marriage. Yes, Victorians love them some long-ass book titles. A true lady will avoid familiarity towards gentlemen. Thus, she should not permit her gentleman friends to address her by her home name. Just miss will do. If you expect to be within shouting distance of any man you know, you must have a chaperone to walk with you. Gesture for emphasis, but never point. Don't be loud. Don't laugh if you can help it. Don't wink. In short, don't attract attention. Someone may get confused and think you're a woman for sale. These books suggest that we ladies don't have strong sexual urges anyway. Dr. William Acton wrote that, the majority of women, happily for society, are not very much troubled with sexual feelings of any kind. Love of home, of children, and of domestic duties are the only passions they feel. Okay, William. 
I'd say that the writers of the New Orleans Medical and Surgical Journal disagree with you, sir. They advise factory foremen to listen for the telltale signs of runaway sewing machines. Ladies working that pedal on the factory floor with too much of a frenzy, rubbing their legs together and such, are sure to be pursuing carnal self-gratification. And men? Well, of course they have carnal urges. Too many, perhaps. But they shouldn't indulge in them too often. As Searchlights on Health tells us, to do so might cause weakness, and even insanity. A self-help book for gentlemen suggests that, however nice it might feel in the moment, masturbation or prostitution soon blight the brightest prospects a young man may have. The author of Life, How to Enjoy, and How to Prolong It concurs. He contests that a single gentlemanly emission is equal to losing two ounces of blood, and that 90% of the deaths from tuberculosis are the result of sexual excess. Because that's science. You know who else thought masturbation made you insane? A guy named Sylvester Graham. A few decades ago, this 30-year-old wayward minister came up with a vegetarian, bland, whole wheat diet aimed almost wholly at suppressing desire and thus decreasing your chances of masturbatory insanity. It's from him that we get the delicious graham cracker, though his version was a lot less appetizing. Who knew that eating a s'more could dampen your desire to touch yourself? Later in the century, a doctor named John Harvey Kellogg will continue the whole nutrition for suppressing sexiness campaign by inventing Kellogg's cornflakes. At his clinic, he'll also give people yogurt enemas and apply carbolic acid to women's sensual parts as an excellent means of allaying the abnormal excitement. So, definitely a stab-worthy doctor. Think about that next time you enjoy a bowl of cereal. Victorian America has a real terror of self-induced sexual pleasure. The fact that finding it is suspected of making you weak and crazy tells us something about Victorian American sexual anxieties, of which there are many. So let's just go ahead and say the Victorian era is not a sexy one, right? Well, maybe not. Those around us have a lot of idealized notions about how men and women should behave, for sure. But these are ideals, something to shoot for. For most people, they're not reality. Women of this era are far from sexless. I mean, their bodies are the same as ours, am I right? Here's an extreme example of Victorian sexuality to counterbalance the Grahams and Kelloggs of the world. Up in Vermont in the 1840s, a man named John Humphrey Noyes started the utopian Oneida community. This is a popular Protestant movement in this century, meant to establish a heaven on earth. One day, John found himself feeling carnally covetous of his neighbor's wife. Lucky for him, said neighbor was also coveting his wife, and both wives were coveting the men in return. So basically, they did a big old partner swap, just for fun, and it only brought them all closer. John suspected that coupling off in marriage was actually bad for the community, as it divided loyalties, and that encouraging the sharing of all things would help create spiritual union in the group. So John formalized the practice into what he called complex marriage. Every man is linked to every woman by divine marriage. If a man feels attracted to a lady, he'll approach her friend to see if she's interested. So the 19th century version of swiping right. If so, they'll retire to a private room and have some fun. The man isn't supposed to orgasm, as the point of this is not to procreate, but to bond. But the woman sure can. In fact, she's encouraged to. In a typical month, community members average five sexual partners. I think it's about time we moved, ladies. Outsiders find this all quite scandalous, but it actually seems like a mostly happy and unusually healthy place. Later in the century, in the 1870s, a delightful feminist named Victoria Woodhull will do many things, among them become the first woman to ever run for president. But she was also a true believer in free love. The idea that maybe we should just loosen the hell up about sex and marriage. Yes, I am a free lover. I have an inalienable, constitutional, and natural right to love whom I may, to love as long or as short a period as I can. 
to change that love every day if I please, and with that right neither you nor any law you can frame have any right to interfere. But these are extreme cases. What about us out here in the general population? Well, there's a bit of a veil over Victorian sexual practices, but sex is certainly a subject of some fascination. We know this in part because of the large number of salacious novels, pamphlets, and newspaper stories available to us, and also because of the rise of the theater. The popularity of the theater is on the rise in the 19th century, and with it several onstage fantasies that can be acceptably viewed while in public. Essentially, women scantily clad, and acting out, and wearing pants, or, you know, almost nothing. Actress Ada Isaacs Mencken will shock audiences in a play called Mazeppa, in which she plays a young page boy punished for having an affair with a countess by being strapped, naked, onto a wild horse who gallops right across the stage. Being bound across the back of a horse in a nude body stocking got everybody talking, including Mark Twain, who called Ada that manly young female. There's a thin line in this era, as in many others, between actresses and prostitutes. Our dear friend Victoria Woodhull will make extra money during her short stint as an actress in San Francisco by heading out into the audience and offering to make the play's fantasies a reality. If you know what I mean. We love a good romance in the Victorian era, especially if it's epic. If it's also erotic in nature, well, that's okay too. Racy lit has long been popular, both highbrow and smutty. At first, most erotic publications came from France and England. Those foreigners! But when the importation of obscene texts became illegal in 1842, American publishers readily stepped up to fill the trashy, pornographic void. Authors like George Thompson, whose nom de plume was Paul de Kock, blatantly copied some salacious foreign works, but also wrote originals of his own. These so-called fancy books have names like Curtains Drawn Up or The Education of Laura and Silas Shovewell and His Amours with the Nuns. At first, these cheap paperbacks bound in telltale yellow were sold at train stations, newsstands, and along the docks. But now we don't even have to go out to find these treasures. Changes in the postal code in the 1850s means these books can now be ordered through the mail. Many of them specialize in voyeurism, complete with illustrations. Look, but don't you touch. There is a lot of descriptions of anatomy in these literary marvels. In The Green Family, or The Veil Removed, published in 1849, a man is so struck by a nude model's, uh, feminine essence that he describes it thus. What a splendid carnation adorns the main aperture with its fascinating fringe of sea moss. Never mind that said model had been drugged and forced into this situation against her will. It's just a book, you know? Just like back in our time, many of these books contain fantasies that are considered taboo. One of these will become particularly poignant during wartime. That is, the combination of violence with pain. While certainly not considered pornography, it's sort of fascinating to note that some works written by abolitionists are accused of using sex to get people to care about the evils of slavery. Even Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote the incendiary Uncle Tom's Cabin, was accused of doing it to try to get people to wake up to the evils of slavery. These abolitionists' intentions were certainly good, but some of the tactics they used to evoke shock and horror were the same ones used by writers like Paul de Kock to titillate their readers. Some abolitionists worried that the undiscerning reader wouldn't be able to tell the difference. With the growth of cheaply available printed material, major newspapers are trying to compete with an ever-growing number of gossip rags by combining women, sex, and violence. In reporting on certain crimes, particularly against lower-class women, we're seeing some of the earliest examples of using sex to sell. Let's stop briefly to examine the case of Dorcas Doyen, which highlights both the highs and lows of prostitution in this era, and how salaciously the media is covering women of loose morals. Dorcas Doyen 
Dorcas was born in Maine to a working-class family with a raging alcoholic father, a deceased mother, and little prospects. She became a domestic servant at 12, and by 17, she was seduced by a bank cashier and soon found herself disgraced and out of a job. So she did what she could. She moved to New York City and became Helen Jouette, high-class woman of the evening. She was much lauded and admired by the men about town, and she became an independent woman. But at only 23, she was murdered, purportedly by a regular customer, Richard Robinson, with a machete. Needless to say, it got a lot of cover in the news. And the way they covered it tells us a lot. These articles lingered over Helen's body, sexualizing both her and the crime. Slowly, I began to discover the lineaments of the corpse, said the New York Herald, one of the prominent newspapers of the time. As one would the beauties of a statue of marble, not a vein was to be seen. The body looked as white, as full, as polished as the pure Parian marble. The perfect figure, the exquisite limbs, the fine face, the full arms, the beautiful bust, all, all surpassing in every respect the Venus de' Medici's. Richard was acquitted, by the way. Helen was later dug up and studied by local medical students. Apparently, her skeleton hung in a closet there, exposed and worked over, even in death. R.I.P. Helen. But let's swerve on back to the ladies and their desires. No matter how many books suggest women shouldn't have sexy feelings, of course they do. We have letters and diary entries to prove it. Though courtship for some women is so strict that they have very little opportunity to explore them. Until they're engaged, that is. Even well-to-do ladies have a hard time keeping their hands off the objects of their affection when their chaperones discreetly leave them in parlors for some alone time. Sometimes this alone time involves... Well, let's ask David Todd. He wrote in his diary that his fiancée, Mabel, will remember with pleasure the new sensation I caused her this evening. And in her diary, she wrote... Well, I couldn't help it. I woke up in the morning very happy, though, and not feeling at all condemned. We don't have a lot of written material about sex in this era, because people didn't write it down, or they later burned it. Letter burning was a pretty common thing. But still, we know that during the war, when married couples are separated for long periods, they write letters back and forth that are the equivalent of steamy sexting. For instance, Julia Higgins wrote several letters to her fiancé about what they'd do together when he came back home. I love you with all my heart and body, she gushed. And I will keep it closed for you when you come home to break it open again. It will be as tight as the first time you tried it. Is it getting hot in here? Starting in the 1890s, a woman doctor named Clelia Duell Mosher will conduct the first study of sexuality in America— and, in doing so, prove that ladies of this era do indeed seek sexual satisfaction. In interviewing 45 women about their sexual desires and practices, she'll find that 78% of them have sexual desires independent of their husband's interest, while 76% say they regularly experience orgasms, and some are very much upset when they don't. One woman interviewed will say she found an unfulfilled orgasm, Bad, even disastrous. So disastrous that it caused nerve-wracking imbalancing if such conditions continue. So there's no reason to believe that we Victorian ladies aren't having fun in the bedroom. But the appropriateness of said fun all depends on how, where, and why. One thing Victorian America is big on is repression. And that produces some neuroses and beliefs that are going to seem strange to our modern ears. There's a belief helped along by doctors, that women who crave sex are somehow depraved. They might even be evil. A sexual woman is closer to nature and our baser instincts, and thus more likely to get out of control. She might even overpower a man and force him to do her bidding. (gasps) Thus, an overtly sexual woman is dangerous. She upsets the delicate balance we're trying to keep. For the most part, we believe that it's totally acceptable to find your jollies, but only if you do it in a marriage bed with at least a vague hope of producing children. 
Desire, when expressed in any way in public, is seen as low-bred and crass. Many people, women included, consider it, or even sex just for pleasure, to be a kind of prostitution. So what happens if, say, you get naked with someone before marriage and everyone finds out about it? Or you run away with a man a la Lydia Bennett? Well, you might be made to marry the rogue who ran away with you. You might end up living on the fringes of society. But the worst fear, of course, is that you'll end up a fallen woman. The fallen woman is a very familiar trope in our culture. Sometimes they're painted as victims, pressed into sin by a man in her life. But often, it's portrayed as the woman's fault. In the book Ellen Merton, The Bell of Lowell, from 1844, a sexually overeager factory worker fell victim to her own unbridled passions. Women's rights activists see prostitution as evidence that it's men's sexual passions that lead to ruined women. But in a time when women are considered moral pillars, a fallen woman has no way to climb her way back up to redemption. She will always be tainted, untouchable. That makes becoming a prostitute, or even being called one, a truly horrifying thing. So let's leave our parlor, have a dalliance or two, and fall on down into a life of prostitution. Ladies and their pleasure have long been tied to two archetypes, the divine woman and the fallen one. But in ancient Mesopotamia, paid sex could be an act of divine devotion. Men would go to visit the temples of Ishtar, goddess of love and war, and pay female acolytes for a sexual union that would lend them sacred strength. Prostitutes are all over the Bible, and sometimes they even use their position to get power. Take a glimpse back in history, and you'll find all sorts of women who started out as prostitutes and went on to become influential rulers. Take Ching Shi, who was a Cantonese prostitute before she became one of the most successful pirate captains of all time. Or Empress Theodora, whose first job was as a famous actress and prostitute, but who married an emperor and was eventually made a saint. Hence why Victorian America has anxieties about sex and, particularly, about prostitutes. We're living in a world of very defined spheres, the public, where men work, and the private, where women are. But a prostitute is a public woman. She has a well-stocking leg in both spheres, The more visible she is, the more she challenges the status quo. Let's talk about the term prostitute. It isn't just for women who trade money for sex. It's for women who trade sex for food, or an apartment, or just a nice time. So, mistresses. It's also sometimes used for women who are loud, drunk, or violate social norms. In short, prostitution isn't just a legal title. It's a stick to threaten women with if they step outside their role. But more on that later. Tighten your corset. We're going to sway our hips through some city streets. How do women end up prostitutes in this era? Well, let's start here. Imagine that you're an immigrant, or maybe you're just poor. Let's talk about your career choices. Your options are as follows. You could become a domestic servant, as an overwhelming number of girls do. Laundressing will earn you 10 bucks a month, if you're lucky. A maid earns four to seven dollars, while well-regarded cooks make seven or eight. The problem with being a domestic is that you often have to live in someone's house, and a chunk of your pay comes in the form of the roof over your head and the food on the table. You'll have very little freedom to come and go. So really, you're pretty close to an indentured servant. Plus, if you lose that place for being naughty, or if, say, your employer seduces you, which is a lot more common than anyone would like to say, you might not get a good reference, thus shutting the door in your face for future positions. For those of you who watch Downton Abbey, you'll know how very dire that situation can be. Perhaps nothing is more telling in terms of how domestic women become prostitutes like a study by Dr. William Sanger. In 1859, Sanger conducted a study of 2,000 prostitutes in New York City's Blackwell's Island Prison, 
which showed that half had worked as domestic servants before becoming ladies of the evening. Another quarter had worked as seamstresses, and the rest were abandoned or abused wives. Many of them were 30 or under, and many were immigrants. About 57% of them were Irish. With a population of 1.2 million, he said, New York City had almost 8,000 harlots. That's one in 150. Most died within four years due to venereal disease or alcoholism, which says a lot about how glamorous such a life is. Or, you know, not. Look, I promised you sex. I didn't say it was always going to be sexy. Instead of domestic servitude, a lot of girls are choosing to work as freelance seamstresses or, increasingly, factory girls. The Industrial Revolution is booming, which means jobs that don't require you to live in someone's house and dump out their privy pots. They offer freedom, allowing you to mix and mingle unchaperoned with boys your own age. In places like the Bowery in New York City, suddenly it's deemed acceptable for engaged couples to have sex before marriage. This kind of job offers freedom, but not security. If the economy takes a dive, you might be out on the street. Plus, it's really dangerous to be a factory girl. This is long before the eight-hour workday, or such a thing as health and safety standards. It's been argued that working as a prostitute in this era is actually safer than working in a factory. In a speech by William Lloyd Garrison, who quotes the experience of a well-meaning missionary who tried to convince a prostitute to change her ways. I know you mean well by coming here, but I don't know how much good it will do. Instead of coming here, you had better go around to some of these factories and shops that grind a poor girl down to $2 a week and get them to pay better wages. It's no use. A girl can't live on what she gets. And not all women are turning tricks full-time. Many a hard-working, working-class girl often finds themselves knocking on the door of prostitution because their wages are so bad they have to side hustle to make ends meet. Hence the common 19th century prejudice that many seamstresses are also for sale. And yes, many were, but that really sucks for seamstresses. It isn't that uncommon to find a family of women, mothers and daughters, cute, turning tricks in their homes on the weekend. This becomes much more likely for single women, or those with husbands who can't or won't provide. As reformer Caroline Dahl proclaimed, to escape poverty, they had to marry, ditch, die, or do worse. But of course, when these women are arrested, most people blame them instead of stopping to consider their environment, means, and circumstances, calling them moral degenerates. Basically, they were born this way. Guys like William Acton and William Sanger, the two shitty Williams, that should be a band name, argue that women fall into the lascivious life because they're just naturally sinful. These women are just clearly bad. It turns out that paying women poor wages without giving them any security net has dire consequences in an environment where women have little agency. Go figure. As our girl Caroline Dahl said, Lust is a better paymaster than the mill owner or a tailor. Compare the price of labor with the price of dishonor, and you will cease to be surprised that women fall. In such circumstances, is a prostitute seizing what power she can, or is she always a victim? It's a question we'll be returning to. So what's day-to-day -day life like for us soiled doves? To some extent, it depends on your situation. In most cities, there's a definite hierarchy. On the bottom rung are free agent streetwalkers. If you're one of these, you're probably free to roam where you want, but you're way more exposed to the law and men's meaner proclivities. There are the part-time prostitutes, actresses, seamstresses, barmaids, and crib women who operate out of exposed rooms, modern-day Amsterdam style, if you're a member of a body house, which range in quality from completely grubby to acceptably so, you'll have to pay some of your wages to your madam or pimp for room, board, and clothes. But if you're lucky, you're in one of the fancier pleasure houses. In these, you'll have a brothel keeper, often an enterprising woman who's done her time in the trenches. She protects her girls from the law, keeps them well-fed, and puts rules in place that help shield them from harsh treatment. 
She also often sets her prices to ensure the girls and she are paid their due. They welcome clients into a private parlor where they are able to indulge in the delights of their choice, including gambling, sumptuous meals, and of course, the many flavors of the flesh, all in perfect privacy. It's a lot like being at home, but in this case, the woman wants to have sex with you in any position you like. In other words, a place where fantasies can unfold. Some of these houses offer particular fancies. s and international lovers. There's a place for you, no matter how you like having your corn ground. Often these houses are grouped into particular street and vice districts to contain them and keep them out of sight. In D.C., this spot is called Murder Bay, which is in what is now Federal Triangle. That's just a stone's throw from the White House and the Capitol building. How convenient! In Richmond, Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy, it's called Locust Alley. In Nashville, Tennessee, it's Smoky Row. These places tend to be loud, wild, busy, and raucous. New York City has such a plethora of such houses that a visitor can get himself a copy of A Vest Pocket Guide to Brothels. It's kind of like a 19th century trip advisor for the prostitute scene. It runs glowing reviews of certain pleasure palaces, calling their inhabitants fairy-like creatures. Others aren't quite so fortunate. Visitors are warned away from 111 Spring Street because it's full of the lowest class of courtesans and is frequently visited by roughs and rowdies and gentlemen who turn their shirts wrong side out when the other side is dirty. And apparently, there really are a lot to choose from. In the 1850s, the estimated total value of New York's sex trade, including the sale of drinks, entertainment, food, board, and services, was over $6 million, which means it beat out the brewing and printing industries combined. Of course, you will find many criminal types hanging out in these neighborhoods, likely using an array of delightful slang. You know I love some good slang, so let's enjoy some. Ladybird. Noun. A kept woman. Lucky that General Hooker has a ladybird to keep his tent warm. Heavers. Noun. Persons in love. Those heavers need to find a room, good and sharp-like. Barking irons. Noun. Pistols. Don't make me get out my barking irons and put you in the ground. Bag of nails. Noun. Everything in confusion. Well, my. Hasn't this robbery just turned into a bag of nails? And, obviously my favorite, Kate. Noun. A smart, brazen-faced woman. My God, this place is full of Kates. I'm never leaving. But you aren't likely to hear such talk at Mary Ann Hall's fancy cat house in Washington City, which occupies a prime position right on the National Mall, where the National Museum of the American Indian will one day stand. Visitors to Madame Hall's grand three-story house are treated to exotic treats like berries and coconuts, and sumptuous meats that include things like turtle. You'll also enjoy a copious amount of French champagne. It's always flowing. Around 18 fancy women live here, servicing well-to-do congressmen and, during the war, military officers. With lavish furnishings, marble tabletops, and much expensive porcelain, this place obviously charges a decent mint for their bone-storming services. But we'll talk way more about this Madame on the Mall in our Patreon episode. In situations like these, prostitutes, and especially the Madams, can do well, saving enough money to buy themselves an independent life. This is particularly true in the West, out on the wild frontier. Prostitutes are largely responsible for turning what are man-filled mining settlements into actual townships, seeing a need and offering to fill it. And they're so popular that they're sometimes the richest person in town. And they give back to their communities, too, offering social services like workers' compensation for injured miners and hospitals for victims of domestic abuse. These powerful ladies even yield political influence. Wyoming will become the first territory to give women the right to vote in 1869, a half-century before the rest of the country. 
In fact, they'll refuse to even become a state unless they're able to keep that right. Way to go, Wyoming. In this way, prostitutes can have more freedom, more independence, and more prosperity than many of their respectable female counterparts. But then, records show that six women will become Civil War soldiers in order to escape a life of prostitution. One V.A. White left home after having a baby out of wedlock, becoming a high-end lady of the evening in Nashville. I know that a great many people believe me to be guilty, so I thought that I would go where I could wear the game as well as have the name. She said she made good money, but grew weary of it. So when Northern troops stopped nearby, she pitched in as was always my way of doing. I bought me a suit of blues and had my hair cut short. And of course, we can't ignore that some women are quite literally forced into the job. The term procurer won't become widely known until later in the century, when a wave of moral reconstruction will sweep through America. But I'm sure it still happened. Women coming to a city in search of work and finding themselves sweet-talked by someone, often a lady, sad to say, then deflowered and thrown into a cat house against her will. So, not a nice thought. While the act of trading sex for money is still a rapidly growing trade, the country's still figuring out what the term prostitute means. And in many states, there aren't specific laws against it. There are laws like the Lorette Ordinance, instituted in New Orleans in 1857 that says that prostitution is legal if they avoid street-level solicitation, indecent dress, and the creation of scandal or disturbance. This is key. Many of the laws aren't really about stopping prostitution altogether. They're about stopping that trade from spilling out into the public sphere, becoming visible, horrifying and confusing everyone about what constitutes a proper lady. That's not to say that soiled doves aren't targeted by the law, but they're usually arrested for other things. Public drunkenness, swearing, fighting with rival prostitutes. Apparently, this is going to happen a lot. But many have enough money to just bail themselves out and get right back to business. While conducting this business, we'll be paying very close attention to our personal hygiene and working to keep ourselves out of the family way. But how? A brothel privy in Boston, which will be rediscovered and studied in 2008 by a team at Boston University, holds some answers. Hair combs, toothbrushes, and toothpaste at a time when vigorous brushing isn't the norm. There are also syringes meant to be applied to the nether region, filled with things like mercury, arsenic, vinegar, and brandy. Stingy. Let's talk some more about family planning as this applies to both soiled doves and your everyday lady. And this isn't just an issue for the single ladies. In an era where childbirth is still somewhat dangerous, many a married woman is keen to limit family size as well. There are melting suppositories, hot sits baths, douches, and a myriad of potions. Or you could try those newfangled French things called condoms. They're made of animal intestine, though, as the ones made of vulcanized rubber won't really come around until about a decade from now. So, have fun with that. Blech. Many people think family planning is a sin and have trouble talking about it. But some couples manage to find their way onto the same page. Take Lester Ward, who, accidentally, left a copy of a guidebook on marriage behind during a walk with his fiancée, Lizzie. He made sure to wander off for long enough that she could have herself a good old read. Some women go directly to each other for help. Mary Hallock Foote wrote to a lady friend with some advice from her own experience. It sounds perfectly revolting, she wrote of her protection methods. But one must face anything rather than the inevitable result of nature's methods. A woman can't be sure she's pregnant until she feels the quickening. In other words, the fetus moving around in her belly. It isn't until the 1920s that there will be a pregnancy test. There is no peeing on a stick in this era. So any attempt to, as they say, restore menses before the quickening happens isn't considered abortion. So amenagogues are readily available by mail, if you know how to look for them. The 1840s saw a rise in the number of ads for mail-order abortifacients. 
Things like Beecham's pills and Dr. Peter's French renovating pills. Helpful tip. If you see the word French in the ad, that's a surefire giveaway. Madame Restel, who ran an abortion clinic for some three decades, and who we'll explore in more depth in our Patreon episode, ran an ad in 1839 aimed not at loose ladies, but at the married women in her crowd. Is it moral for parents to increase their families, regardless of consequences to themselves or the well-being of their offspring, when a simple, easy, healthy, and certain remedy is within our control? But sometimes it's too late for such remedies, and you need to resort to dire measures. There are some doctors who might help you, like Madame Restel, but most women can't or won't go to them. Instead, they'll take matters into their own hands. Most of these measures are passed down in oral tradition, concoctions made at home that contain things like get ready, dried chicken parts, gunpowder, calomel, a juniper variety called savine, and turpentine. Yummy. But let's be clear, women who employ these methods are from all classes, both married and not. Three studies done in the 1860s suggest that up to 20% of pregnancies end in abortion. And in fact, the woman most likely to avail herself of an abortion is white, native-born, Protestant, and middle class. It's particularly prevalent among those who can't afford to be pregnant. So, unmarried women, particularly poor ones or servants. One of these, an African-American woman named Emily Beeks, tried to get herself out of the family way by drinking a tea of wild tansy, whiskey, and borax. That's the stuff you find in laundry detergent. That's what happens when you take away support and education in the realm of reproduction. Just saying. But let's leave this darkness behind us for now and get back to the Cyprian ladies. What happens to the sex trade and women's sex lives in general when the Civil War starts up? The war is loosening a whole lot of things. hey Including Victorian America's courtship rituals where before you wouldn't even be alone with a man until you were engaged to him, and your entire courtship will probably have been chaperoned by guardians. Increased travel and freedom means that men and women are able to spend time together as never before. Before, a respectable girl wouldn't have been caught dead walking through the street without a chaperone. Now they're doing it all over the place, and it's got everybody hot and bothered. War has a way of heightening emotion while also relaxing the romantic atmosphere. There's nothing like a man in uniform to get the wild heart jumping, and nothing like the fear of losing said soldier to make a girl hitch her wagon to a questionable match. A 16-year-old Southern belle from Richmond wrote, It is wicked in me to wish that I might have gone out to see them and not to wish that I had gone to church but I love the soldiers so much that I forget about almost everything else. Some women worry they'll die an old maid if they don't hurry up and find themselves a husband. So they're making quick romantic decisions, often without consulting their family. Secret engagements and loose arrangements abound. One Georgia girl wrote to her fiancé in the army that, Neither of us is to consider this engagement binding. If another is loved, no sense of honor will prevent our immediately letting the other know of it. But a girl has to be careful. Confederate officer Frank Adams wrote home to his sister about a soldier who married a new woman every time his regiment moved from town to town. A woman in Richmond, upon becoming pregnant after having an affair with a married officer, tried to give herself an abortion and died. Well, that got dark quickly. With all of this social and moral laxity happening, things can get a little wild real quick. Especially in cities like Washington and Richmond, which are full of soldiers, and prostitutes who are becoming much more visible than they've ever been before. With this kind of upheaval, an unwilling lady nurse or volunteer might find herself in waters she'd rather not swim in. But a willing lady of the evening has an opportunity to turn a roaring trade. In occupied cities where soldiers are billeted, with little to do outside of drilling, houses of ill repute pop up in spades. In Nashville, Tennessee, the number of prostitutes jumps from about 200 in 1860 to 1,500 just two years later. 
In Washington, some reports put the number of body houses at 500 and the number of soiled doves at 5,000. One soldier wrote to his wife that, It is said that one house of every 10 is a body house. It is a perfect Sodom. But others are rather pleased with this situation. Soldiers go down the line together, a shorthand expression for going to a harlot's den. They have delightful names, sometimes war-themed. Fort Sumter, The Headquarters, USA. I tell you, wrote a soldier who was apparently quite enjoying his time in the big smoke. Lager beer and a horse and a buggy in in the evening. Horizontal refreshments. Most of these houses in Washington are in Murder Bay, where lady-loving general Joseph Hooker was asked to contain them. A lot of people called the neighborhood Hooker's Division. Sadly, the term Hooker was not born because of him, but some of his exploits explain why that theory holds. Some soldiers don't even have to seek it out, really. The ladies, helpfully, come to them. In Memphis, some women set up floating brothels and will go swimming next to naval boats in, as one witness put it, a costume similar to that worn by Mrs. Eve. Sometimes soldiers even help set up villages for ladies of the evening to make sure that they're always close at hand. One young sanitary commission worker wrote angrily home to his father about how soldiers in City Point, Virginia, had used army money to set up a whole city of whores. When he complained to one of the higher-ups, he argued that soldiers needed such outlets. They'd been told that they weren't allowed to rape Southern women. One boy had already been executed for doing so. So this was to keep them on more or less the straight and narrow. It was a necessary evil. Think of it, Father. He implies our devoted soldiers would become rapers and satyrs if not for these creatures. The demand is huge. Even temperate men who love their wives sometimes struggle to abstain. Why? These men don't have the usual checks and balances that they've become accustomed to. Many are young and probably have never had a sexual experience. Many of them have never been away from home. Both ladies and men struggle with the pressing question. They could die tomorrow. Why not live tonight? Plus, it was considered a way to showcase your manhood. As one private who spent time in Nashville reminisced, there was an old saying that no man could be a soldier unless he had gone through Smoky Row. And why are so many women taking up the life? Well, because in an unstable economy, it's a way to make some money fast. As the war goes on, many women are made widows, face financial ruin, and the need to make it on their own. When you're living on the razor edge of destitution and every street corner is bursting with cashed-up soldiers, well, desperate times call for desperate measures. Many of the military higher-ups don't love the sudden influx of ladies of the evening. Suddenly they're wearing middle-class clothes, riding openly in carriages, and arm-in-arm with men down the street. As one soldier wrote home to his wife, They monopolize everything. I have seen six and eight in a carriage driving by, drinking and carousing, singing and hollering like so many drunken men. But they can be useful to the war effort now and again. Engaging in pillow talk with officers can help a girl procure important secrets, making prostitutes well poised to be spies. Thomas McNiven, the leader of a union spy network in Richmond, found a prolific source in Clara A., as he called her, who catered to high-ranking officers in Richmond's Locust Alley. From her diary, because these gems are too good not to mention, General Limpy, the food fop. He must do the undressing. Shoes, too. Four big generals last night came together. Redbeard really has red hair all over. Christ! The praying general was brought in today by Preacher H., He is rough and brutal. After I serviced him, he dropped to his knees and asked God to forgive me for my sins. Again, the problem isn't that prostitution exists. That's long been true. It's that it's just becoming too visible. And thus the army tries to crack down through crime and punishment. In Washington, General Order 17 decreed that police should arrest all public prostitutes and all persons who lead a lewd and lascivious life. When such orders fail, 
Officials take on the out of sight, out of mind approach. In Washington, all southern leaning loose ladies were more than welcome to have safe passage over the Mason Dixon line. Go forth and prosper, ladies, please, somewhere else. But mostly, prostitution is viewed as a major impediment to the war effort. They present a particular danger that Confederate soldier J.M. Jordan wrote home to his wife about. I feel a delicacy in spelling them out to you as you are a female person. But, however, I reckon you can't blush little things these times. It is the pox and the clap. Venereal disease is not a passing problem. It's a serious crisis. In the Union Army, we're talking more than 73,000 cases of syphilis and 100,000 of gonorrhea. So about 10% of white Union soldiers will catch themselves a sexual disease. Those that contract them are often out for long periods, unable to fight anything at all. The 1864 Manual of Instructions for Enlisting and Discharging Soldiers instructs physicians to reject men with eruptions of the skin and mucous membranes. Blech. So those with obvious signs of venereal disease were sent packing, left to trot back home and give it to their wives. Hooray! Of course, the symptoms aren't nice, and they're often deadly. If you're feeling like being grossed out back in our century, go ahead and Google Civil War plus syphilis. Or don't, if you don't want to have bad dreams forever. The women, of course, suffer too, from things like blindness, paralysis, infertility, and birth defects. Treatments are also terrible, as we covered in our Lady Nurses episode. We're talking things straight out of a fantasy novel. I've found doctor's notes about the use of black wash, blue vitriol, and lunar caustic. What are those things? Let's not find out. It's telling that one of the most effective treatments is a mercury steam bath. It helps for a while with symptoms, but it isn't a permanent cure. But you know what they say, a night with Venus, a lifetime with mercury. And of course they blame the women for the moral ills and physical ailments cropping up amongst the troops. It can't be the soldier's fault, damn it! Such things are born of the evil uterus. We all know that. Prostitutes prove a wonderful scapegoat for soldiers' choices and for military failures at large. So how to deal with this vexing problem? Major General William Rosecrans, who led the Union's Army of the Cumberland, was not best pleased with the number of soiled doves plying their trade with his soldiers in Nashville's Smoky Row. So Nashville's Provost Marshal Colonel George Spaulding devised a plan. If he couldn't make the soldiers stop going to the ladies, then he'd simply remove the temptation. He rounded the ladies up, then forced them all onto a boat called, I kid you not, the Idaho. You the ho, I said that you's a ho. On a voyage northward. The horrified captain said that having 111 of Nashville's ladies of the evening on his vessel was going to make his life difficult. And indeed it did. No matter where he landed, no one would let him unload his cargo from what was called the floating whorehouse. And meanwhile, back in Nashville, more prostitutes just moved in to fill the void. While this is, on the face of it, very funny, these boat-bound ladies were suffering pretty bad conditions. Many were hustled on board without even a change of clothing, and what little alcohol they'd managed to pilfer on with them was gone by day two. There was fighting. Knives were apparently involved. Eventually, the captain returned to Nashville and squatted on the docks until the authorities let him unload. The captain was eventually reimbursed for the damages. But the deported women never were. I mean, kidnapping's cool. So Spaulding changed tack. Maybe he couldn't stop sex from happening, but he could make sure it happened safely. And thus, we have America's first attempt to regulate prostitution. Each prostitute was made to register, buying a $5 license that gave her permission to work. An Army-approved doctor would then examine her every 10 to 15 days, which of course she had to pay for. Prostituting without a license, or failing to appear for scheduled exams, meant arrest for up to 30 days. If she doesn't pass the exam, she'll be sent to Hospital Number 11, or the Pest House, 
and isn't allowed to leave until she's 100% cured. These women are essentially forced in, like it or not, subject to guards watching over them and the threat of solitary confinement. Wait, is this a hospital or a prison? Hmm. But for many prostitutes, this is a big improvement. Regulation means they get regular medical care in a time when these were in short supply and often out of their reach. They're no longer backdoor dealers. And guess what? It turns out that bringing such industries out in the open can be beneficial for all concerned. They're regularly meeting up together, not in competition, but in open solidarity, giving them a sense of community that they've never felt before. And for the doctors treating these women, they learn a lot about how the disease is spread. Hey, they discover, it looks like the men are also spreading the disease to the women. Not that anyone listens, of course. To do so would mean blaming men. To keep soldiers from answering the siren song of temptation, there are plenty of smutty materials floating around camp. So many, in fact, that Colonel Lafayette Baker, Union secret agent, confiscated $22,000 worth of obscene material, made a bonfire of this sensual trash on the White House lawn, and invited President Lincoln to watch. That's a way to get a president's attention. We should try it. Bonfire full of bras, anyone? Carte de Vigite, also called Barrack's Favorites, are pictures cheaply bought at about 12 cents a piece and mounted on cardboard, meant to be traded, kind of like playing cards. They often feature nude actresses and have names like The Wood Nymph's Frolic and Toilet Mysteries. Okay. Meant to whisk the fighting men away. But there's one that's specifically war-themed, called Storming the Enemy's Breastworks. It features, according to one ad, An amorous Union soldier playing with a secesh maiden, making a very indelicate assault. Which is creepy on a number of levels, because it seems to be suggesting that a Confederate woman who says no to a Union officer probably actually means yes. Under the circumstances, we must conclude that the breastworks unconditionally surrendered. Yikes. Another very popular work around camp is the novel Fanny Hill, Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure, complete with delightful illustrations. It's about a young, innocent English farm girl taking up the life of a prostitute and finding it all quite to her liking. Let's read an excerpt aloud, as Union Colonel Ebenezer Pierce did to his privates in his tent of an evening. If you've got sensitive ears, I'd close them now. As he stood on one side, unbuttoning his waistcoat and breeches, her fat, brawny thighs hung down, and the whole greasy landscape lay fairly open to my view. A wide, open-mouthed gap, overshaded with a grisly bush, seemed held out like a beggar's wallet for its provision. Classy. This kind of stuff might help bond soldiers or soothe a lonely night, or whatever. But it's problematic for women who spend time in and around army camps. As the war goes on, many women start following the army around. There are vivandiers, who hold an official position with the army and wear uniforms like those of the regiment with which they serve. They're almost like NFL water girls, tending to the soldiers on the battlefield. And then there are camp followers. The Daily Crescent newspaper put these women into three groups the wives and daughters of officers, cooks and laundresses, there to either sell their services or support a relative. And then there are ladies of the evening. But it seems that some soldiers can't tell the difference between them. They're all technically public women, as they're all doing things in public, so men can no longer hang a woman's virtue on whether or not she stays at home. Many soldiers, including Orville C. Bumpus, thought that the war was turning all women into prostitutes. Almost all of the women are given a whoredom and are the ugliest, sallow-faced, shaggy-headed, barefooted, dirty wenches you ever saw. And he's not the only one who thinks the women of America are going to hell in a handbasket. A woman from Mississippi complained, in a letter to a friend, that you could have a Southern girl for just a few pounds of coffee. And it's true that, in a war-torn country... There are many women in dire situations who feel they have no choice if they want to survive. So how to tell who's a prostitute and who isn't? Is the mistress of John Barger of the 11th Tennessee Cavalry one because she came to war with him and sleeps in his tent? 
What about Harriet Merrill, who was convinced to dress up as a man and join the army so she could be Captain Jerome B. Taft's knightly comfort? Their presence, as well as the actual harlots, blurs the line between who is fair game and who isn't. So really, independent women on their own, and doing anything outside the bounds of polite society in a public space, are suspect. For us ladies, this is perilous ground, which leads to some serious trouble. Now it's time to talk about Union General Benjamin Beast Butler. And how did he get that delightful little nickname? Butler made many bold moves during his time in the army, but one of the ones he's most famous for is called the Woman Order, or General Order No. 28. In 1862, he and his troops came to occupy New Orleans. The men of the town were happy to acquiesce, but the upper-class ladies were very mean to him and his soldiers. They exited churches when his officers entered them and encouraged the singing of Confederate songs. They also dumped what I hope were the contents of their chamber pots all over their heads. So he created the Woman Order, which avowed that any lady by whose gesture, word, or act showed contempt for any U.S. officer would be arrested and treated as a woman of the town. Or, as disapproving Confederate P.G.T. Beauregard put it, to treat at their pleasure the ladies of the South as common harlots. This kind of name-calling is a serious business. One, it strikes at the honor of Southern women, demeaning them in ways they find degrading and upsetting. But also, think of the implications. Does this order mean a Union soldier can assault you if you get a little lippy? If you're labeled as a prostitute, what happens next? Southerners are outraged by this order, but our friend Beast defended it later, saying no one was ever arrested under the order. It was just to keep the ladies in line. Tell that to Eugenia Levy Phillips, who was arrested and detained at Ship Island for laughing at a Union officer. And Anne LaRue, arrested for wearing Confederate colors and handing out flyers. There's still a line between ladies and prostitutes, but orders like this one subvert and confuse it. Working women, whether they're offering their laundry and nursing services or spying on the enemy to try and aid the cause, fall into a tense kind of gray area in a time when anger and confusion are running high. And so while I've heard the Civil War referred to as a gentleman's war, it was often anything but. This is where, unsurprisingly, things get a lot less sexy. We don't know how much rape happened on the Confederate side of things, as many of their records were destroyed at the end of the war, and many victims probably never came forward. But we do know that, by 1865, more than 400 Union soldiers had been court-martialed for sexual crimes against women. In occupied Southern lands, civilian women at home often fear they will be raped if the Union takes over their town, and that's a fair fear to have, especially early on. 33-year-old Mary Kirksey, a white widow in Tennessee, had her house and stable taken over as the headquarters of the 28th Pennsylvania Regiment. She did their sewing and laundry and sold them milk and eggs to help support herself. But Charles Hunter decided that this wasn't enough from this Southern woman. He tied her arms with her apron strings, gagged her with a leather strap, and had his way. When he was taken to court over it, he alleged that Mary had a reputation as a bad woman, which is why he felt he could take what he wanted without too much concern for her honor. Oh, Charles, if only I had my throwing stars handy. But the women who suffer most are African American. I hate to break it to those of you who think the Yankees are all about liberating the enslaved and being beacons of freedom and equality, because often they are not. Grace Barnes, a young, free black woman, did washing for Union troops at Pongo Bridge Camp near Norfolk, Virginia. While walking home one day with a pile of laundry, seven Union soldiers dragged her into the bushes and did some truly horrible things. Let's make sure to time travel back to this precise moment with some bear spray and a taser in our skirts, shall we? The punishment for this kind of crime is variable, but there are rules set in place about it. 
Abe Lincoln crafted General Order No. 100, or the Lieber Code, in 1863, which dictated how the enemy should be treated, particularly civilians and women. It said that, Rape, if committed by an American soldier in a hostile country against its inhabitants, are not only punishable as at home, but in all cases in which death is not inflicted, the severer punishment shall be preferred. But even when they go to trial, it's clear how difficult a time Victorian America has in talking about this crime out loud. When sentencing one gentleman in Georgia, the court didn't say anything about rape. Instead, they said that he feloniously did ravish and carnally know her. Hanging or death by firing squad are the usual punishment. That's if the men are convicted, which they aren't always, and often their sentences are commuted. Take Grace Barnes's case. I'd love to tell you that they were all drawn and quartered and that their testicles were removed by force. But no. While six of the seven men were handed guilty verdicts, all but one of their sentences were overturned, and they were returned to active duty. Only one of them saw any jail time. Sweet job, Justice! At least under the Lieber Code, women finally had a way to fight back against their aggressors. This military law gives them an opportunity that the civilian law doesn't allow. In 1864, teenage Jenny Green, who escaped slavery and went to the Union Army for shelter, was raped by Lieutenant Andrew J. Smith. Instead of being forced into silence, she was able to bring charges against him. She was even allowed to testify which is kind of a big deal for this era. I'm happy to report that Smith was discharged from the army and sentenced to 10 years of hard labor. I'm unhappy to report that the jury wrote a note pleading that Andrew Smith's former good character should allow him some clemency. Though many who reviewed the case disagreed, Abe Lincoln made a questionable call by requesting that attorney William Johnston revisit the case. In his report, Johnston managed to turn poor Jenny from an innocent child to a wicked woman who fails in her attempt to seduce a man and pretends that an attempt was made to ravish her. The she started it argument. Ah, that old chestnut. These stories are tough to stomach, I know. And sadly, there are many more. So let's end this dark chapter with a story that at least offers something of a happy ending. In 1864, a group of black laundresses, Keziah and Laura Davis, Emma Smith, Elizabeth Dallas, Rose Plummer, and, yes, this is real, Elizabeth Taylor, were accosted in their laundry hut by four white officers. They exposed themselves, made rude suggestions, and proffered a bucket of oysters as payment. One of them tried to force Elizabeth into bed with him. When she said, no thanks, he called her a bitch to which she replied that she was no more a bitch than he was a son of a bitch. FYI, this is from a court transcript. Keziah scorched the oyster man with a candle, and he later had the gall to ask her not to tell anyone because it would be embarrassing for him. But guess what? She did, and now we're embarrassing him more than 200 years later. In a way, you could say that all women who work for and around the military are becoming public women. They're leaving the private sphere behind, both by choice and out of necessity, discovering new professions and new ways of moving through the world. And with that comes a new kind of freedom. So in this new landscape, does sex empower them or does it endanger them? Are women finding sexual liberation in these turbulent times? or just finding their way into new webs of prejudice. There are a lot of potential lessons the 21st century time traveler could take home as a little souvenir from our journey. Perhaps how regulating sex work can lead to better conditions for the women involved. Perhaps how important it is to talk about sex and give all women a means of support for dealing with its consequences. But on that front, I'll let you decide. In the meantime, we can be sure that not all Victorian women were as buttoned up as we like to think they were. And whatever else they had to suffer, or gain, at least we know that some of them are having fun between the sheets. Until next time.
Thanks for listening to the Explores. If you liked it, please go subscribe and rate it on Apple Podcasts. It'll help other people discover it. For loads of great visuals to go along with this episode, follow me on Instagram at the Explores Podcast. For show notes, including a list of my sources, suggested reading, and more, check out my website, www.theexplorespodcast.com. Come find me on Twitter at The Explores Pod and Facebook at The Explores Podcast. I'd love to hear from you. If you liked this episode, go to my Patreon page and become a patron. You'll get access to bonus episodes, including one about Madame Rustel and the Madame on the Mall, Marianne Hall. Just go to patreon.com and look up The Explores. See you there! Much love to Paul Gablonski for my theme music and logo, and to the following legends for their vocal stylings. John Armstrong, Stephen Reichel, three excellent chevaliers, Philip, Caroline, and Jackie, Billy Kaplan, Adam Deck, Andrew Goldman, Avery Downing, Caitlin Seifert, and Beth Farrah Cohn. Next time on the Explores. Close your eyes and picture a Civil War soldier. I'll bet it's a man with a musket you're seeing. But women were soldiers, too. They cut off their hair, pulled on some pants, and headed out to the field disguised as men. And not just a couple of them, hundreds of them. In this episode, we'll discover why they went, how they pulled off their disguise, how they got caught, and what happened when they were, and how it is that, by some 100 years later, their stories were quite literally erased from history. Put on a boxy jacket, grab some vitamins, and clench your teeth. Let's go traveling. Traveling.